Today, you are going to get a front row seat to the behind the scenes story of the 1999 Rugby World Cup through the eyes of the Springboks with assistant coach Heineke Meyer. Heineke, welcome to Front Row Rugby. Thank you. Great honor to speak to you. Always a big pleasure. Well, it's lovely to have you on the show as well. Now, just before we begin our conversation, here's a look at today's trivia question. Who was the top try scorer for the Springboks at the 1999 Rugby World Cup? Now, if you know the answer to the question, you can put it in the comment section down below. And we'll also find out if Heineken knows the answer, or perhaps I should say remembers the answer. But we'll do that at the end of our conversation. Heineken, tell me, how is it that you actually became the Springbok assistant coach in those days? Yeah, it's quite, a, quite an interesting story. Um, I usually tell this in a lot of motivational talks as well. But just briefly, um, you know, just after the World Cup, I was a schoolboy coach and always wanted to coach at the highest level. And that was my dream to get involved. But I wasn't the best player around. And uh, in those days, you have to be either a general in the army or you have to be a professor at university to coach at the high level. And I was, I was none. But I always had a dream to coach in, uh, in the World Cup. And believe it or not, uh, so in 95, we tried to save money to go to the 99 World Cup. And then uh, I was a schoolboy teacher by then. And then suddenly, rapid and professional, <clears throat> I got a position at Southwestern Districts, which was that those days a small union. And uh, they went like in the D division. And I started coaching there, did really quite well. Um, had a nice team, beat most of the big unions, played in the semifinal of the Curry Cup. And then uh, those days, it was the Stormers. And was made up by Boerland, Southwestern Districts, and uh, and uh, you know Western Province those days. And Alan Solomons was the head coach. And then, as a young forwards coach from Southwestern Districts, he got me involved, which I'm thankful uh, to coach. Uh, this was the first year of the Men in Black, and we had an unbelievable season that that time. And we had a very young forward back, and actually did very very well scrummaging wise. And uh, I remember the Bulls were the Carry Cup champions the previous year, and they had a huge scrum, so we actually out scrummed them. And we had a brilliant season with Solly. And then, um, you know, Solly was the assistant with Nick and then introduced me to Nick and then, um, you know, made me the forward coach. So from being a schoolboy coach in, uh, in the 96 uh, until 99, four years being there, I was 32 years old, as young as most of the forwards. So it was a huge honor and uh, it was unbelievable. It was just a dream come true. And, and, you know, I always say this, you know, whenever you dream, you, you know, you can achieve. You just really, really work hard and, uh, you need some luck as well, but it's a big honor to be involved at such a young age. That's a great story. Uh, Heineke, before the team departed for that World Cup in 99, obviously we were the defending champions going into that tournament. What was the feeling among the coaching staff in terms of us being able to go there and win it and defend the title successfully? Yeah, obviously um, those days in New Zealand was quite strong. Australia was always strong. The tri Nations was very strong. So we had our up and downs, but we felt we had a good side. Um, I mean, when you're South Africa, you always, you know, people expect you to go out and win. So if you don't believe in yourself, um, you know, you don't have a chance. England also had a good side. Uh, they had a good side. So there was a lot to choose between the top sides. So uh, we knew we had a good chance. Uh, World Cups, you need some luck as well. And you need depth and good leadership. And, um, you know, it's all about playing. We play in the knockout stages. So uh, we knew we had a chance, but we knew it's going to be tough. So... Those days, we didn't have a lot of time to prepare, um, but uh, we were well prepared and we always felt we had a good chance to win it. And obviously, Nick Mallett was the head coach, but you were an assistant and you were there to help with the forwards. Explain to us, what exactly was your role on the training ground? Yeah, again, looking back now, <clears throat> it's so professional now. Those days was, uh, like I said, with that young forward back and most of those guys went into the World Cup. Uh, we just out scrum everybody in Super Rugby. So nowadays, it's like a front row guy that does a scrummaging. I didn't know that much about scrummaging, but that Southwestern District back those days were huge back, huge guys. So we just out scrum everybody at Southwestern Districts and then at the Stormers. So believe it or not, I was a scrum coach as well. And an interesting story, we, uh, it was all over the newspapers. We had a, um, I developed a scrum machine and we... Uh, you know, it wasn't like technology like now where you can just buy from Rhino or whatsoever. So we made our own scrumming machine. It was called uh, the, uh, the Green Mamba. We painted green. And that machine was traveling all over the world with us, you know, gooing it, in, you know, with air flight. So it was unbelievable. It went from town to town, this huge scrumming machine. So I was the, the scrumming gym coach. And then uh, I also was in charge of the forwards, all the breakdown, and then uh, also obviously the line outs. So I was totally in charge of the forwards. Which I'd say again, you know, that young age, you know, there was great players, you know, guys like Mark Andrews, I think was probably the same age, a little bit older than me, Crane or Otto, uh, a lot of legends, you know. So um, for me as a youngster, it was an unbelievable um, experience. And I must say the players were brilliant. 
they accepted me as a youngster. I think the fact that I've been with the Stormers and we did really, really well um, just helped. But yeah, I was basically in charge of, of the forwards. So, Heineke, we beat Scotland in our opening game. It was a solid performance. So we won quite uh, convincingly in the end, especially when you look at the, the scoreline. But then we had teams like Spain and Uruguay in our group. And even though we won those matches comfortably, it almost looked, watching it on the television, as I recall at the time, as if we were almost struggling to get going. What is it about opponents like that that makes it so difficult to combat? Yeah, I think obviously back home, you know, people expect the Springboks to just totally outplay those teams. And uh, <clears throat> those guys are no, no disrespect. Um, especially Uruguay was quite tough. These guys know they just want to, you know, they just want to defend and keep the score low. So sometimes they play negative, but it's not an excuse. I think people underestimate those teams. You know, a lot of those guys, even, even in looking after 95, and I'm not, I'm getting old now. My memory is not what it used to be. But even if you look at 95 World Cup, we, you know, we won. Even Canada, um, you know, that was also a tough game at home. So uh, Uruguay was tough. Spain, you know, not as tough like I could remember. But I think, again, um, obviously your, your guys know there's big games coming. They don't want injuries. All want to play in the playoffs. So uh, the guys don't go then, you know, sometimes maybe a little bit lethargic. But again, you know, you have to create credit to those teams. You know, they put their bodies on the line. They're well prepared. They lift their game. And it's not that easy because uh, they also got some quality sides, even if they wasn't that well known at that stage. But it is difficult playing these guys. We also played a lot of that of the other guys so you mix the team you have to give everyone a chance because in the playoffs there's usually three games and you need guys and there's always injuries so we also mix the team quite a lot and obviously the internet was quite new at that stage and i don't even think google was even a company yet uh, so how difficult was it to gather information on opponents like that yeah first of all just not that you know just sitting here thinking back now um you know that england game you always knew it's going to be a it's going to be a big game and i remember um i was also the technical advisor of the Springboks. And uh, those days, believe it or not, so I got a guy in through Brendan Fender, John McFall, and he's still coaching with me after 30 years. Uh, so I spoke to Nick Mallet and I said, you know, let's get somebody in that knows England. So we had like, I promise you, like boxes and boxes of uh, VHS machines, uh, big tapes, suitcases that we carry around because I asked John to, to take VHS videos of, of uh, England and make a tape of every single guy that's played for England and the smaller tapes. So not just not just those two teams wherever, because uh, you know not even there wasn't even uh, there was no like you said internet, but not even uh, um, pr programs or computer programs that you can use to look at guys like now. We had you know manually tape guys, tape over, give it to the players. Uh, it was it was very really, really difficult, and especially those guys, you had no footage, um, especially Spain, Uruguay. You saw them just play at the World Cup, but uh, you're so busy preparing that you, it, it, it took a day or two to tape the game and then try and cut it. So it was quite tough those days. You didn't have all the technology like now, and you have to do everything manually. I remember after games, myself and John would sit, and then we will go through the whole game with a piece of paper and a pen, and then we'll go and do the stats. So you would go, in, you take the VHS video, sometimes it breaks. And then you would go, and then we, at every rack we would we would stop the, the, the you know the stop button, and then we would count how many cleaners is there, and then we would write it on a piece of paper. We wrote all the names down, and then just put like a little dot, if they say say Crane Otto cleans and and Mark Anderson that clean, and then we count the dots. So now it's big companies doing all those things. So we would work manually off the game right through the night, but it was also great to learn and you know learn about the game. But it was it was very difficult in those days to get any sort of info. It seems unbelievable when you describe it like that now, today, given uh, all the technology and all of that stuff. Heineke, what was your relationship like with Nick Mallet? Yeah, we, from the start, we had a great, great relationship. Even to this day, you know, we're still very good friends. Not always see him that much. But uh, he was a great guy. Um, he was a great motivator. He was very good to me and Alan. Uh, obviously, they were all much, probably 10, 15 years older than me. Um, I've learned a lot from Solly as well. Um, first with the Stormers and then with the Springboks. He was a meticulous organizer. Uh, Nick was a very good uh, communicator and he was a very good motivator. And at that stage, nobody in the world had defenses coaches. And that's why I thought Nick started off so well because he was in France and did a lot of defense. He was very clued on with defense. So um, I learned a lot from him, but we had a great relationship. And uh, to this day, you know, he trusted me with the forwards. He trusted my inputs. It was just great to, you know, to work with him. I think I'm quite emotional. He's, he's quite emotional. So there's a bat and Sol is more meticulous and he's more laid, you know, laid back and very, very uh, scientific. But I think myself and Nick, a lot, you know, we're quite the same. And I learned a lot from him, but we had a great relationship. And even till this day, you know, we, we're still good friends. Phone him for advice. And if I have time, we meet up. I stay now in the 
my coach here in Houston, but I also stay in the Southern Cape and he's there as well. So uh, we had a great relationship. And again, till this day, uh, he was a mentor to me. And just a fact, looking back now, that I'm like more or less his age. Um, you know, when I was the forward coach, just to give me all that responsibility at such a young age was, was you know, it's unbelievable looking back now. It really is. Uh, so, Henneke, when the Springboks won the World Cup most recently, 2019, and then there was the documentary that came out and we saw behind the scenes footage. We saw at halftime, Rassi Rasmus, who was the head coach at the time, he would talk. And then Jacques Ninaba would talk as well. Maybe Mswandile Stick would also talk a little bit in the dressing room at halftime. Was that also the case with you guys in 1999? Yeah, if I can recollect, I'm not 100% sure, but I think uh, uh, half times was much shorter then. I think it became longer and longer with TV ads coming in and more TV space. I think it was probably 10 minutes. But yeah, like I said, Nick trusts me completely with the forwards. Um, you know, so I would run all the, you know, he would probably, it's always, usually how it works uh, nowadays, the, head, the medical team goes around, the head coach say a few words, then you split forwards and backs, and then you get together and, and the head coach speaks. Um, but he gave me a lot of leeway. Had inputs half time, spoke to the forwards, he knew what he wanted. Um, he was mostly overall, and Solly spoke to the back. So, yeah, he gave me at half time, we had a lot of talks. Um, and I, I think just not that as well is, uh, you know, I've done it all, which is such, a, such an honor. Um, and those days, I was actually the guy running water. So, although I was the forward coach, I, I see videos of myself. I think Peter, the, Peter, Peter scored by just jumping the air. Um, so, seeing myself young and running up. So a lot of the messages, I was with Nick on, on, on and, and radio contact just started like, actually we started in Southwestern Districts two, two, three years before. So there wasn't even, you know, radio contact in those days. So it just started the year or two before, but we were all linked up. So I was on the touch line and uh, giving feedback to him and, and, and vice versa. So we were always in contact. And like I said, he gave me a lot of opportunity. Do you really know your rugby? Do you always get your predictions right? Why not make some money then? Open an account right now with Tic Tac Bets and get up to 2,000 Rand and 20 spins with your first deposit. The link is appearing on your screen and I'll also put it in the description area. Please note that this is an affiliate link and I will make a little commission on it. Winners know when to stop. National Responsible Gambling Program, toll free helpline 0800 006 008. No persons under the age of 18 years are permitted to gamble. I remember hearing a radio interview with Joost van der Westezen in those days. He was the captain, of course, for the 99 World Cup. And he said that the players didn't really feel as if they were at a World Cup while they were in Scotland. Uh, and then they only really felt that they were at a World Cup when, once they moved to France for the quarterfinals and then obviously uh, to England for the semifinals. I'm interested to hear what your perspective was uh, as being one of the coaching staff. You know, first of all, you must, uh, uh, just as a general, no disrespect to any nation, I think as a general rule, it's better to have the, old, the World Cup in one nation because teams are closer together and you get more TV coverage. And like I said, those days, you must understand, there weren't Instagram or there weren't, you know, there weren't a lot of TV programs. There weren't like internet. So you, only what you saw is what, what you see on the TV, um, you know, maybe one or two programs. So there was no, you know, phones and stuff like that. You can just see the rugby 24-7. It sounds crazy saying that, but it, that was the truth. Um, so as I understand, a lot of those guys, you asked, <clears throat> actually you said interesting stories. Um, I knew the way for me to coach at the highest level, I don't want to go off the point, was uh, to go through a teaching system. So I was a, uh, I studied everything um, that you can to get into rugby, physical education. I studied psychology and then teaching as well. And then uh, US was actually, uh, he was also studying teaching. And as a student, he was actually, uh, you know, in, under my supervision for a year. And I started my schooling as a young teacher at the school where he was in trick, if I weren't all. So he was there with me for years. I know him well. We came back such, you know, way back. Um, but just to get back to the, 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 the question is that, um, um, so for me, it was like my second year in international rugby. You and those guys have played like 70, 80 test matches. So they've been around. So for me, it was unbelievable just to be overseas. You know, it's just, just amazing. And I love Scotland, you know. So it was, for me, it was just unbelievable to be in Scotland and, and France and just be involved in the World Cup. And I think we played in Twickenham. So for me, it was just great. Um, and then I look at the 2015 World Cup and I was the, you know, was, was, was the head coach. But I think it is quite easier when, when everything is in one nation and it's, and it's quite, you know, closer to each other because you see teams on the airports, you, you, um, you know, you mingle with guys, the press is following. But I must say for me, it was, you know, I love Scotland, great people. Uh, great city. Um, so for me, every every single test match was so special. But uh, a lot of the guys felt, 
when the knockout stages come, that's when the World Cup starts. And and in a sense, that's actually true. You know, you know, when once any team can win it, mostly the guys go through to the to the, to the knockout, and then you know any team can win it. You have to win three games. So that's usually, I think, all World Cups when it actually starts. I must say, I actually took my wife on holiday to Scotland a few years ago, and I must agree with you. I thought it was a beautiful country. I thought Edinburgh is a lovely city, and then we went went up uh, into the Eastern Highlands. Magnificent views, uh, stunning stuff. Uh, but uh, back on topic, um, we went to France for the quarterfinal uh, against England. Now, of course, it's known popularly as the Yanni de Beer Show. Who came up with that tactic? <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of stories. Uh, I don't want to take any credit but just just from my view i think it's like you know as things grow and everybody's got a different viewpoint but as i as i can recollect is uh, um i was quite through john mcfarlane that uh, introduced me uh, um, uh brennan actually introduced me to john mcfarlane to help us with the technical side especially on england um so i i uh I was, like i said i was a like a young coach and a sponge i just sit next to brendan and he was playing in uh, i think london irish those days so you know the english team quite well and myself and Brendan and John spent a lot of time because John was also technical advisor at London Irish. So they were very close friends. So obviously they spoke a lot at night and I, I didn't know Brendan that well. Uh, he was a good uh, tactician and he, he played against the English and know them very well. So we would sit every night and over dinner and just, you know, just speak rugby, not just what we're going to do against England, just speak rugby. And I was learning a lot being from South Africa. I haven't been overseas that much. And then, um, as I can recollect, over dinner, myself, Brendan, was talking and, and uh, how to beat England and what can we do. And then I think he came up with the idea, you know, maybe we must go for one or two drop goals because there's always... And, and Henry Hannibal was also in the squad, but that game specifically, Yanni played. And I remember myself, Yanni, and, and Brendan talking, and then we spoke to Nick. Uh, and we thought, okay, let's give Yanni a go, probably for one or two drop goals. And I remember the call was Bok till this day, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why I remember that, that well. So my recollection is, um, so we went to Nick and uh, it wasn't my idea, but I was taking it to Nick as the forward coach and being close with Brendan. And Nick was quite keen and said, okay, let's have a go. But what I can remember, which is my side of the story, and there's so many sides. So I remember, like I said, I was running up and down the touch and Nick was in my ear. And I know four of the five times, and I think the players also took, uh, you know, they also had the decision from their side. But I remember four of those five drop goals. I actually, from, from the side, gave the call, Bok, go for the drop. Um, and again, it was unbelievable just to stand there on the touch judge, being so close to the play and just see these drop goals going over one by one. And uh, that was amazing. So uh, I think probably at the end, it was Brendan and, and Yanni that came up with the idea, but uh, it worked. And that was a great England side and uh, unbelievable to be so part of it. And like I said, so close, being on the field to almost every drop goal. It was unbelievable, and it's one of those Springbok test matches that you just remember as if it was yesterday, certainly for me anyway. Heineke, as the assistant coach, was there any particular player that maybe you got on really well with? Yeah, I think at that stage, obviously, I still to this day, I don't believe you can have favourites. Um, and especially, I was quite young, so I particularly distanced me from the team, uh, mostly because I was part of the coaching staff. But like I said, myself and US was the captain, so we, we came quite quite a uh, you know, long way. And not just that, uh, um, because I was the Stormers, there was a lot of Stormers guys. But I must say, everybody was really great to me. There was a good team spirit in the team. Um, so most of the guys, you know, a lot of respect for most of them. There's a lot of superstars there. So I was quite close to most of the guys. I must say, we had a quite knit. Um, and I still believe that, uh, you know, we were so close, we probably would have beaten the All Blacks if we, we did play the, beat them in the playoffs. Um, if we went through and it was... I don't know if you're going to ask the question how we lost that game, which was also a freak way Australia won it. But yeah, we were so close to winning that World Cup and probably both World Cups in 2015. And you know, it was also a drop goal uh, against New Zealand with two points. So I lost two World Cups, I think both with two, if I can recollect. I am going to ask you about that semi-final against the Wallabies. Uh, a tight, tight affair, went to extra time. How much of a sucker punch was it to lose the way that we did? Yeah, it was tough. If I can recollect, like I said, I'm getting old now. I can't. You know, it's been 23 years back. I, I, if I can, I think Yanni had to kick the last goal uh, to take us through. And I, I, I was also giving up the tee, and I stood next to him just at the back when I, I think I, I took up the tee as well. And it was an unbelievable kick to take us through. And then, you know, as the years gone by, I, I also coach a few Australian guys at Super Rugby or wherever. And, and the joke was apparently that Larkham. That week, he says, well, Yannick can put five drop goals over. Um, he can. And he didn't even train it. He just, 
I think the guy said to me that one at training and it was like way, way off target. So I think that was probably his first and last drop goal, not just in test match rugby, I think ever. I think he never, ever went for a drop goal. So uh, it, was, it was such deja vu or whatever, I don't know what's the English word, that we, uh, you know, we won with five brilliant drop goals. Here comes Larkham's never done a drop goal. And in extra time, I knew we had a chance, extra time. They were a really quality side. Uh, there was not a lot to choose between us, New Zealand, Australia, and, and, and uh, you know, the All Blacks always there. And uh, to lose with a drop goal for guys never, ever put over a drop goal was just, it was just mind-blowing. Uh, you always knew it was going to be tough, but we always had the feeling against Australia, our forwards will get an upper hand and then, you know, hopefully we'll pull it through. And, and Yanni was kicking brilliantly. And then Larkham, out of nowhere, you know, we could defend everything. The one thing we, we didn't actually plan for or then thought they would go for was, was a drop goal. And like I've always said, you need some luck. Uh, I've, both World Cups, I was knocked out. Both was by, a, was by a drop goal. And if you look at Stransky's drop goal in 95, if you look at most drop goals, you know, Wilkinson, uh, I think, what was it? The one that England won. So there's always, the, the teams are so close. It's always either a penalty or a drop, drop goal can make the difference. Quite right. Now, Henneke, the day after we lost that semi-final to the Wallabies, France pulled off one of the great upsets in the history of not just the tournament, but I think the sport. Uh, a sensational victory over the All Blacks in that second semi-final. What was your reaction to that? Strange thing is, so Nick, Nick used to coach Stade Francais, and uh, just the night before, two nights before, uh, we always went out as a, as, a, as a coaching team just like for dinner and just, you know, um, you know, discuss tactics and just speak to each other. So, because he coached in, in, in Stade Francais he knew, he, and was French speaking, a lot of French friends, um, we had a dinner with a lot of his French uh, friends. And then that night, um, you know, a lot of the guys said, listen, Dominici, and we're going to beat the All Blacks. And we were laughing at them. So, you've got no chance. There's no chance that you're going to beat the All Blacks. Okay. So the whole my those guys, you know, we had one or two wines and they just said, listen, France is going to be the All Blacks. And we all said there's no chance that, you know, the French is always going to be the All Blacks. We know they can always cause an upset and usually against New Zealand. But that was a brilliant New Zealand side. And uh, the strange thing, you, know, you, you always respect your opponent. But the strange thing is, again, like I said, there was no video footage. So we had to collect all the footage from New Zealand from every game and start to cut it VHS to VHS and try it because we thought we're probably going to play if we go through. As a technical advisor, you have to think a week or two in advance, but you're so busy coaching. So we were already getting a lot of footage from New Zealand, what they did, start to planning against New Zealand. We knew, you know, France always got a chance, but we didn't prepare and got as much footage as, as, uh, as we had in New Zealand. And I couldn't believe the whole time they just said, uh, you know, France is going to beat New Zealand. And uh, it, we were shocked because that was a great, great New Zealand team and France really played well so um, we couldn't believe we were kicked out and New Zealand and, and, in, and then we were going to the third playoff which was, could have been a final so the top four teams are so close you know it even taken 2019 when we won it uh, New Zealand actually beat South Africa in, in the first games and then um, we went through for the first time ever to win it by losing a game so you need some luck and again like I said we lost by two points with, with a drop goal so but again coming back uh, I, won't say, yeah, I was shocked because that was a great New Zealand side, but on the day in World Cups, anything can happen. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not consider becoming a patron? You can click on my Patreon link, I'll put it on the screen as well as in the description box, and there will be great benefits for members. Let's get back to the interview. What is it like preparing for a third, fourth place playoff? Because I'm sure you'd rather be preparing for the final, right? No, I must say to you, we actually discussed it and always been discussing it that we said we should probably cancel that game and I know it's for also for you know for um, going forwards for the pools you know because if you if you're third and third or fourth it makes a difference in which pool you go but I mean that is the that is the I've had it now twice we you know we were so close and and, and, and came short in the in the last probably the last game um, so it was I'm, I can't tell you uh, being a South African and, uh, you know, you know what it means for your country and you know the whole country is be behind you and what a win will do for the country. I mean, you're absolutely, absolutely devastating after a game like that. You're like, you know, I, I know myself, you don't even speak to someone. You just walk the streets for a day or two just to get your composure back because you, your whole dream, and not just your dream, you've got, a, you've got a whole responsibility of the of the whole South Africa and people outside South Africa on your shoulders. So it's, especially to the coaches, it's a devastating blow. And then, um, 
you know, the next day we start to prepare for a game, which is nothing in. It's like, so it was very, very, very difficult. I remember now sitting here and playing it in my mind. I remember Nick that actually did a great thing. Uh, just gave the guys two days off just to recover and get through the huge disappointment. And I think what he did well as well, he was so disappointed. He gave a lot of guys, uh, um, you know, a chance in that game that hasn't played. A lot of guys that was, we knew it was their last games. They're going to, you know, they're going to quit international rugby. And again, that was a brilliant game against the All Blacks. You know, to be the All Blacks is always unbelievable. Um, I was worried that we will be them because we were so devastated. But I suppose the same with them. You know, I, I remember looking back now as, as, as we talk, see the images. I remember walking back and when the All Blacks lost that game, I remember seeing a lot of their players just walking back after that France game. And I, I had the same feeling. So to get yourself back to proud nations, to get back into to play a third playoff is, is, a, is a really, you have to, you know, dig deep. And especially playing the All Blacks, you know, you, you never need motivation playing the All Blacks, but we were so devastating to get back and to win that game. So it says a lot about the character of that team. And it's only afterwards that you think, yeah, we probably could have won the World Cup because we were so close against Australia. So, uh, but you have to take your chances. Uh, just great memories. So close yet so far, hey? So, Heineke, you were the assistant coach in 1999. Nick Mallett was the head coach. But Nick was the assistant coach in 1996. And some of the Springboks that I've had on this show have told me that they played a prank on him where they gave him sleeping tablets and he sort of fell asleep on the team bus on the way to training. I wonder, did the players play any pranks on you? No, I was quite lucky, uh, thinking back. Not really. No, I was quite lucky. So, uh, not that I can relate. Uh, so, uh, mostly the... the the players were unbelievable, you know, just, it's like, you can't believe, you know, they uh, represent the country and they're great, but they're still young men and they just, it's always pranks. I remember always thinking close to Willie Mayer, the two mayors would sit together and he was like the funniest guy that I've probably ever met. So I always had a great time flying, but I, I, there's so many stories, you know, it's like what happened and behind the scenes and those days we didn't film it, but I always remember just vividly that uh, whenever there was a new player coming in, I, I, for me, it was so strange. Um, so we would go to the airport and then you'd stand there in, in your Springbok blazers and there's always press and stuff. And uh, then you just, I mean, people don't realize that when you tour, um, you know, it's, it's a touring group of almost 50 people. It's, everybody's got three bags. You go for like eight weeks and you got so many kits and you got talks and you got like, like I said, a scrumming machine, you got balls, you got scrumming bags. It's a huge, you know, it's a huge, huge lot amount of, of, of traveling and equipment and stuff. And I always remember, I, I found it quite funny that whenever there was a new Springbok or a new player, we would stand at the carousel and then all these hundreds of Springbok bags will come. And then you, I mean, you fly all over the world, you're so tired, you just stand at the carousel and just look in front of you and waiting for your bag because they all look the same, it's just got numbers. But it's like, you, could have, you got like three, four bags. And then you would stand there in the beginning, I just couldn't believe it. And then you'd see, they would just come one, uh, like a toothbrush comes around and you thought, oh, you know, maybe... Somebody just, a toothbrush just fell out. And then you would see an underpan comes around. And then you would look again. And then it's like, so it's all these little individual items. And then suddenly it's always the new player. So somebody would take his bag and then just take every single thing out and put it, you know, one by one on the carousel. <laughs> and then while he's waiting for his bag, obviously bags didn't come because they took it off. And then he's just checking and he sees his, like after the third time, he doesn't recognize his toothbrush. And then the next thing, and then he starts to recognize his underpan. And then the poor guy must run in front of the press, everyone, and then try and collect his bag and then stand like for 10 minutes and the bus wants to go and just put in his toothbrush, just pack, almost repack his whole, his whole case. But uh, the guys were always funny. But uh, usually test week, you know, the guys were really, really focused. But we had great times. And uh, I think there was less scrutiny those days. You know, now the guys are 24-7 with social media, with, with uh, you know, everybody's got a phone. Those days, I think, and especially even before uh, when I started coaching, unbelievable what the guys did to each other. But it's always great to be involved in the Springboks. A huge honor. And, uh, you know, it was great those days. The memories last for a lifetime. That's a great story indeed. Okay, Heineke, we're going to finish off by looking again at the trivia question. Who was the top try scorer for the Springboks at the 1999 Rugby World Cup? Heineke, do you know the answer? I don't think so. Huh? I don't think so. The correct answer is Joost van der Westhuizen. Okay. Just interesting about Joost and that, and that uh, um, just one thing about, you know, and that's the things I like and the stories I like. Just one thing you asked me who I was close with. So Joost actually uh, uh, taught his, his, his uh, ACL in, in the previous, I think it was uh, in England, against England. And he came to me and said, please don't tell Nick 
Uh, I'm going to play. I don't care if I play with no ligaments. I'm going to play that game. So he shouldn't have played, you know, going forward. And um, his ligaments were, were torn. And uh, he just taped that and got stuck in. And that was the character of that, of that guy. And a lot of the Springboks those days, you know, they just got stuck in. So uh, great memories looking, thinking back now. Yeah, I, uh, but I'm not good with things like that. You know, I'm, I just believe everybody in the team is, is, is exactly the same. And the guy scoring tries just because the forwards probably scrum so well, gave them a good ball. But uh, he was an amazing player. You know, he was my captain at the Bulls. He was captain at the Springboks with him. And I've, I've been with him for quite some time. But he was a warrior. You know, he played with no ligaments in that, in that playoff game. So uh, unbelievable leader off the field as well. That's incredible courage. And yes, he was a great player and fondly remembered by the fans. I think uh, a legend in his own right, no doubt about it. Heineken, let me say it was lovely having you on Front Row Rugby today. An absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for sharing some of those amazing stories. And I hope that we can have you on again in the future, specifically to come and talk about your time as the Springbok head coach. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Always nice to speak rugby. And again, so thank all the supporters. It was great being involved and a huge honor. And thanks for the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. I'm also working on a lot of Rugby World Cup related content and I'll put that in a playlist over here for you to go and watch. See you next time.